Uh, hello everybody, we are here today to discuss about uh, acute aortic dissection. Uh, I am Dr. Ahmed Sofhi Abu Azm, Registrar of Cardiology in Gabriel Hospital. Uh, so first I will start with a case presentation uh, like this one. This is a 53 year old man presented to the emergency department with syncope. And this patient report abrupt onset of severe sharp chest pain prior to the syncopal episode. So for this patient, uh, first we, we did for him an ECG, and this is the ECG uh, of this patient. As it obviously, uh, you can see that there are some S-segment depression uh, in lead one and uh, also in, in, uh, in lead uh, EVL and also in the inferior lead. Uh, we have also a segment elevation in V1 and uh, also diffuse SD segment depression in all the precordial lead. For for this patient, we uh, as this patient uh, presented with uh, a chest pain and ECG changes, uh, so we think about it, it could be acute coronary syndrome. So uh, actually, while we do the ECG of this patient, the patient so, uh, show a sign of hyperfusion. As the patient had perfuse sweating and blood pressure start to become low, so uh, we think about activation of the CAS lab and we give this patient antiplatelet and anticoagulation. Actually, in the CAS lab, uh, in the CAS lab, this is an angiographic uh, founding. Uh, actually, we go with the cast uh, in the ascending uh, thoracic aorta and then in the arch and descending. And after injection of the dye outside the coronary, the, we can see this uh, something like aneurysm, and we have some uh, tear here and also tear here. So uh, for for this patient, uh, actually we shifted him to do CT aortography, and this is the image. Actually, this is a horrible. Uh, as we have a dil some dilatation of the ascending aorta and you can see here this spiral tear that also appear here goes through all through uh, the aorta uh, actually what happened for this patient this patient is arrested on the table and died so first we ask ourselves what is the acute aortic syndrome we have a three types of acute aortic syndrome that we can start from here the first thing is intramural hematoma and as you can see it it, uh, it is called se separation of the media of the blood vessel into two layer outer layer and inner layer actually it could start with that and then rupture inside the lumen to cause a penetrating ulcer or it could be uh, extended into uh, the media and cause aortic dissection actually what is happened what is started we cannot know it may be started with a penetrating ulcer and then proceed to our dissection or it may be started with intramural hematoma and then become like ulcer or dissection so our dissection is the most common catastrophic of the aorta to three times more common than rupture of the abdominal aorta and actually if it is lifted on three this 33 percent of the patient die with the first 24 hour and 50 percent die with the, within 84 hour the two-week mortality rate approaches 75 percent in patient with undiagnosed ascending aorta dissection so the section of the thoracic aorta have been classified anatomically by two different methods so the first one we have a uh, Stanford classification and also we have a Depecky classification as you can see here we have a three type of Depecky classification and this is considered a surgical classification okay the first uh, we will start with type 2 type 2 it means that the section involves only the ascending thoracic aorta and if it is involved the descending thoracic aorta and all through the aorta it is type 3 and if it is whole through the aorta from the ascending to go down it is type 1 actually in medical practice we depend on a Stanford classification not a Depecky one so for a Stanford classification we have type A if it is involved the ascending aorta type B if it is not involved the ascending aorta okay so Actually, we have another classification about the acute and subacute and the chronic. If it is below uh, two weeks, or if it is above three months, or if it is in between. So, 
Stanford classification type A require urgent surgery and type B can be managed medically. In type A, uh, it is associated with higher mortality. Actually, 1-2% to of patients will die uh, per hour. So, uh, we need for this patient to refer him urgently to the theater room. So, actually, why this happened? This may happen due to rupture of the aorta or due to extension of the dissection. If it is a rupture, it may rupture in the pericardium, cause cardiac tamponade. It may rupture in the pleura, cause hemothorax. And it may extend, may extend down to go to the valve, like the aortic valve, and cause valvular dysfunction, or the coronary artery to cause coronary dissection. And also, it may go up to the great vessels, and also may go to down to any visceral vessel and cause visceral malperfusion. Okay, so what mistake happened in the first case scenario? The first thing actually when should you suspect about acute aorta dissection? The first thing is the history of the history. From the history, we need to know actually who is at risk and what are the pain features of the high risk and what are, what are the examinations of the high risk. This is the algorithm. Okay, I will uh, discuss it separately like this one. So, actually, if we have any patient with chest pain or uh, we need uh, we need actually if any patient presented with chest pain or abdominal pain or any back pain any syncope any symptoms uh, with perfusion deficit like uh, especially if the patient present with any neurological symptoms or the patient present with any ischemia like myocardial ischemia or any limb ischemia we need first to ask ourselves who high risk and what is the symptoms and what is the examination so if this patient uh, known a case of Marfan syndrome or any connective tissue disease like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or something like that if this patient had a family history of aortic disease or any recent manipulation of the aorta especially if this one have aortic valve uh, disease or aortic valve replacement or any recent cast or non-aortic uh, thoracic aortic aneurysm so if a, if a patient with high risk presented with any abrupt onset chest pain, severe onset, severe in intensity and abrupt in onset, this pain may be uh, rubbing, may be tearing, may be sharp, may be stabbing pain, okay, and this pain may happen in the chest, maybe in the back, maybe in the upper abdomen. So, if you have a patient with high risk presented with a chest pain, we need to examine this patient perfectly. First, you should for every patient with present with a chest pain to palpate the pulse bilaterally measure the blood pressure bilaterally it is very important okay and also you need to sculpt the chest for uh, any new onset of murmur especially uh, if aortic regurgitation and if you have a patient like that so we will go to the next step the next step means that you need to categorize the patient according to the risk if a patient have no high risk feature or if have one or of have more than one so if the patient in low risk if, if the patient in low risk that means that the patient not have any high risk feature that means that we can uh, proceed with a diagnostic evaluation as clinical indication by presentation according to the presentation of this patient but at least at least we may need to do for him a chest x-ray okay so if a patient present with high risk we need to this patient to do a, 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 an image procedure to diagnose the worst section or to rule out okay so for this patient we will proceed to transesophageal echo if a patient is unstable or to do ct scan with contrast if a patient is stable and and also we can do mr okay so the important one is the intermediate risk. So at least if you have any patient present with a chest pain, we need to do ECG. We need to do chest X-ray. So the important initial investigation for patient present with a chest pain first is ECG to be sure that this patient don't have a uh, segment elevation myocardial infarction. And even if it is have a segment elevation myocardial infarction, we need to check the X-ray. Okay. If the X-ray present with a widening of the superior mediastinum, that means that this patient may have uh, aortic resection. Okay. So, uh, 
also so uh, if we do this image we will erase the diagnosis of our section is present or not if it is present we will proceed to the, treat the treatment pathway if not present we need to know what cause for this patient's chest pain okay so we have a pretest probability if uh, the patient has a chest pain one of the initial investigation we do is a d-dimer if low probability and negative D-dimer, it rule out the aortic dissection and it's type 2A. And if it is high probability, okay, we don't need to do a D-dimer. Then we will proceed to transesophageal echo. If a patient unstable, we will do a trans, uh, first we start with transthoracic echo. If unstable, transesophageal echo in the first place. Uh, but if it is stable, we do a CT scan. Okay. So uh, to sum up this point, so if we have a patient with a chest pain, we need to know if the patient is high risk or intermediate risk to have aortic dissection. And if the patient had uh, intermediate risk of aortic dissection, we need to, to do ECG and chest X-ray to be sure that, okay? Also, if the patient intermediate risk and you, do, you did ECG and you did chest X-ray and still you have a suspicion, we need to proceed for a transesophageal echo if unstable or CT scan uh, of a, if the patient is stable. So, we have something mentioned in the guideline. It is a triple rule out uh, uh, image. And that means that we uh, did uh, a CT scan. It is ECG gated with contrast for a patient with acute chest pain. Actually, in this image, uh, we take an image of the coronary arteries, we take an image of the pulmonary arteries, and also we take an image of the all through the aorta. So it is very important this uh, technique to rule out uh, a three serious uh, causes of acute chest pain. One of them is coronary artery disease, pulmonary embolism, and acute aortic dissection. So I will speak about the investigation now. So it is very important to know if you are a radiologist or if you are a cardiologist and you will you will do any image to diagnose acute aortic dissection actually the surgeon need to answer about certain questions the first one what is the entry of the tear because you know if the entry of the tear is present in the ascending aorta and it is not a peer and if you not inform uh, the surgeon about that this patient may be you may tell him that the dissection appear only in the descending aorta so this patient you will manage him medically but the entry of the tear is present in the ascending aorta and also if a patient have any re-entry tear and also what is the extension and very important if you have a false lumen it is thrombosed or not because if it is thrombosed that means that the, the, uh, the instance of rupture will be low and very important thing, I will explain it later on, it's about the true lumen, it is dynamic or, or you have a, st a static flap. Also the expansion of the aorta, because if it is increased, this means the instance of rupture is high. If it is involved in a visceral or any uh, any organ malperfusion and, or, and also about the aorta dimension. This is very important thing, especially if you will do uh, intervention for the aorta. Okay, so... Uh, about this video, this important video about the aortic section, we will explain about type A and versus type B aortic dissection in this video. So, as you see here, we have uh, the heart and also the aorta. And if we will go closer uh, to the aorta, to be sure about the image. So, you will see the sinotubular junction, and this is the first part of the ascending aorta that means that from here the ascending aorta start and we have also subclavian artery and also if we have a type b it will start from distal to the subclavian artery that means from the descending aorta so important thing to understand the differentiate between static versus dynamic obstruction in type b dissection so I will explain it 
in this image it is very important actually uh, to see here like so if you focus here this is the start of the intramural hematoma it will expand and push the inner flap this is a true human this is a false human so if you focus here okay this is with every hard pulse wave with every beat this will push the inner flap so if you have any side branch here or any visceral branch like a renal artery this will go inside like fingering like fingering like fingering to obstruct and so the distal blood will be thrombosed okay this is very important actually to understand about this point what about the ECG actually the ECG may be normal in a patient with a word section and actually they do a study in 63 uh, patients actually 90% of them is normal ECG actually this is another ECG finding and actually if you see this one okay so the first question when you see the ECG like this you have a diffuse ST segment depression in all the precordial lead and in one and EVL okay and you have a slight S segment elevation in EVR and V1 you may consider uh, severe myocardial ischemia yes you are true it could happen in left main disease yes it could happen in uh, in multi multi vessel coronary disease yes but also it could happen in aortic dissection could happen in severe anemia could happen in pulmonary embolism it could happen in some electrolyte disturbance like potassium and if the patient takes tricyclic and depressant drug it's very important to rule out all the causes of ECG changes. What about the chest X-ray? In a chest X-ray, actually in 62% 60, of the patient, you may have a widening of the mediastinum. Okay? And like this. So, the superior mediastinum is wide. You should suspect. And this one. This one is a patient with a warted section. And he have a hemorrhage in the left pleura due to rupture of the aortic section you can see the widening of the mediastinum here and with haziness of the left pleura so the important thing is the ct scan and actually it is very important because it gives answer a lot of questions that i that i ask you about the importance of the image for the physician or for the surgeon and sensitivity and specificity around 95 percent and it's very important to give you a confirmation about the type of the lesion and the location extension and the evaluation of the true and false human. So, you can see here, this is a CT scan, this is the ascending aorta, and you can see a flap here. Okay? And this is the arch, aortic arch, and you can see a tear here. And this is the descending aorta, and you can see a tear here. So, what about the echo? We have a transthoracic and transesophageal echo. Transesophageal echo has a great sensitivity and the specificity than transthoracic echo. And actually, transesophageal echo is accurate, like a CT scan and MRI. It's very important. It could be a bit side echo, transesophageal echo. You can see here this transesophageal echo, and uh, you can see here the flap first one you can see here is a flap okay and this is the descending aorta okay you can see also the thrombus and widening of the aorta and you can see here the turbulence of the flow into the descending aorta and this is a false human this is a true human okay so uh, this is very important uh, echocardiography actually it's a transesophageal echo they will explain a uh, very important one so this is the descending aorta and you can see this is a true human okay and this is a false human you can see the true human is very very smaller in comparison to the false human here this is a false human this is a true human this is what i explained previously about the dynamic the dynamic flap okay it's very important image actually to see Okay, so we have also MRI. 
So MRI sensitivity is very high. Actually, it is very high. Okay, and it is most sensitive method for diagnose aortic section and have a specificity like CT scan. So see this image, and this is the MRI of the aortic section. Okay, see here. Look, look to another time. See here. What is this? What is this? This line is this, it is represent acute aortic section. So we have something in the ER. It's called fast. This one is due for any patient present with trauma. And actually, if any patient present with chest pain, we need to do fast. Okay. I will start this video, and it is very important <laughs> to understand. So I will explain it. You have this is a CT scan. Okay. You have a probe of ultrasound and also small probe for echocardiography or. Uh, to see the, the, the vessels so you can see here we have this one in the epigastrium so a very important uh, image you need to see now okay what is this this is a liver and this is a water and you can see here this flap this moving flap is very important actually to do if, if you if you have a patient with uh, aortic dissection or suspect so we have a type 1 aortic dissection and we need to ref refer him for open heart surgery and if you have a type B uncomplicated we will give medical therapy and if it's complicated we will we will do a TFR so I will explain it later on okay so for type 1 aortic dissection we will Actually, this patient mortality rate is very high, 1 to 2% per hour. We need to do urgent surgical intervention, and the aim of the surgery is to cut and replace. Okay, so the area of the aorta with the intimate material usually resected, cut, and replaced with a dacron graft. And according to the site, we will determine the type of the surgery. For this patient, if not operative, the mortality will be 50% in the first 48 hour. And if operative, the pre-operative mortality is 25%. It will decrease to half. And actually, actually, by one month, the mortality rate will decrease to 90%. It's very important. But we have a serious complication. Actually, serious complications are rare with the ascending hours section. And if the section involved with the arch are more complicated than those involved with the ascending aorta, the neurological complication may be 80%. It's very important, actually, maybe 18%. So, for optimal repair, actually, as I mentioned before, we need the important image to answer about a lot of questions. The first one, if the valve affect or not. Because if the valve affect, we will re do a replacement of the valve also, especially if it's a aortic valve. If the coronary ostia affected or not, because if it is affected, we will do reimplantation of the coronary arteries into the graft. And the supraaortic arch, if it is if it is affected or not, we have a two kind of operation we can do: this end-to-end -end grafting or island technique. Or if you patient present with any neurological symptoms, that means that if no, it means better outcome to interfere for a patient who is present with neurological symptoms less than five hours from the initiation of the symptoms. And if you have any malperfusion syndrome, we will do a surgical plus hybrid treatment, or we can do a fenestration of the intimal flap. So I will explain this. The first thing, if if you have only only uh, the ascending aorta affected, we will do a dacron graft like this. We will cut from here to here and about this graft. But if you have some of the arch affected without the great vessels, so we will do a hemi arch replacement, a replacement of the ascending aorta and part of the arch. But if you if this uh, dissection extended 
up to the descending aorta we will replace replace what replace the ascending aorta and the arch and we will stop at here and we will do this like hip ride and i will explain it later on also if you have uh, some part uh, uh, below the, the below the below subclavian artery affected we can do this it's called total arch replacement this very big 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 surgery okay this is what we called a uh, island that means that you will cut all the great vessel and implant them into the graft if the section involves the great vessel so let me explain to you how can we do this kind of surgery It is called a bright surgery. They mean combination of a surgery, surgery and intervention. Okay. So, if you have any dissection involved all through this part. So, what will happen? You need to change. You need to replace the ascending. The ascending thoracic by surgery. And you need also to replace from here to here by intervention. So the surgery will, will open the chest of the patient and will put a tacron patch here but before it we need to do that. See here. We will go by a catheter from the femoral artery and we will go up. This is the section happen. See? Okay. He will open and cut it. But we need to cover also this part. So we will go up from the femoral artery and here to appear to the surgeon. The surgeon is stay here. Okay. And then we will bring this. What is this? You can see here now. I will go through the wire. I open the chest from here. Go through the wire, go down, 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 down to the thoracic, descending thoracic aorta, and I will stay here. Then I will open, open, open this mesh like this. As you see. Okay. After I open it, I will withdraw all the system. Okay, and I will expand this one. And the surgeon will, will do some stitches. Okay. Yes, this is finished. So, I will do some stitches here to fix this one. Okay. Then I will make this like an arch and ascending aorta. So I will bring all the grid vessel, connect them here. And if any problem with the coronary, I will connect the coronary here. It's very important. It's called a bride. It's called a bride. It's very important procedure. In type B the section. So in type B, we should ask ourselves if a patient complicated or not. Complicated that means the patient have severe pain or uncontrolled hypertension. The patient had malperfusion. The patient had any sign of rupture and the extension of the dissection increase and the aortic start to be acutely expanded. So the aim of the treatment is what? We need to close the entry. We need to close the entry and cover the biomembrane, cover the stent. And we need to expand the true lumen to redirect the blood through the true lumen. And if you expand the true lumen, you will induce thrombosis in the false lumen and make it hard. So you will decrease the chance of rupture. And you will need to ensure the flow to the visceral organ. So, first you need to ask yourself if you have if this patient can get for TVAR or not. If not, you will do a surgery. So, like this one. We have a rupture here, 
so you will go up by a wire from the femoral artery over this wire you have a stented graft and you will by a balloon expand this stented graft so what will you do you will cover the proximal entry tear and this is very first and very important thing and you will direct the blood through the true lumen and you will cause compression of the false lumen to make it thrombosed like this this is very important okay you can see here actually this is used to cover aneurysm uh, the idea is the same this is the grafted stent dacron cover stent this is stent over a balloon we have a delivered system okay uh, this stent will okay this is a delivered system okay this is a stent here very long if you can see and this is very thick so you need to make a tear inside the femoral artery to go through by this delivered system If you can imagine this is the aneurysm and it looks like the dissection this is the idea the idea i will put a graft stent here to redirect the blood okay also this is a graft stent so i will i will go through 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 until you reach the dissection or you reach the aneurysm and you will expand uh, this uh, this like this you will finish the expansion and this is under the screen okay okay in type b dissection if it is uncomplicated we will treat medically we can do also tvar but if you treat this patient medically you need to close follow up by CT scan or MRI that means that every three months in the first year and every six months in the second year and then every year it's very important if you treat any patient with type B dissection that means that the section is distal to the subclavian artery distal to the, uh, the right uh, the left subclavian artery and if it is uncomplicated okay uh, actually, uh, in the treatment of this patient, we, we found that no clinical benefit between TVAR and the medical, and the mortality uh, will be lower uh, within five uh, years in the TVAR if it, is, if it is done. So, the medical treatment. What is the medical treatment? The aim is to elimination of the pain, to control the blood pressure between 100 and 100, uh, 120, and to control the heart rate between uh, 60 and 80 beat per minute. So for the pain, we can give him IV morphine sulfate. For hypertension, we need to give a sodium nitroglycide. And the dose, it will be given by IV infusion, 0.5 to 3 mic per kg per minute. And for the heart rate, we need to give IV beta blocker. And if it is contraindicated, we can use a calcium channel blockers. So we can give uh, ismolol, and actually the available one is labetalol. Labetalol given as a bolus 20 to 80 mg every 5 to 10 minutes to 80 and 300 mg total dose. Okay, it's very important. So, for him, for home message, the diagnosis depends on clinical suspicion. And you need to check for the section prior to administration of thrombolytic in a patient present with chest pain and ECG changes. The important thing, if any patient present with a chest pain, you need to measure the blood pressure in post arm and also palpate the pulse in post arm. This is very important message. And also, if any patient present with a chest pain, especially if the ECG show no ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, we need to do for him a chest X-ray. Thank you very much.